It's just we never expected a digital revolution that would be so powerful that it could reduce marginal costs very low, in which profit margins shrink. When profit margins shrink, market capitalism is already over. And markets are transactional. They're too slow for a digital world. You have a seller, you have a buyer, they come together, you make a deal, and then it's over. The downtime after each transaction, you have warehouses, you have employees, you have pension funds to pay, you have advertising, you have marketing. So in a world that flows with digital, market transactions are too slow. We are moving from markets, capitalist markets, to capitalist networks. We're moving from ownership to access. We're moving from sellers and buyers to providers and users. We're moving from GDP to quality of life indicators. We're moving from productivity to regenerativity. We're moving from externalities to circularity. This is a big shift. Because when marginal costs become very low, you have to move from, mar to, from market transactions to network flows. So even though the, the profits margins are low, when you come together across competencies and you're managing provider user networks, it's a 24-7 flow. It never stops. So even though your margins are low, you're still making it on a constant flow without interruption. You with me? Some of the marginal costs are getting so low, they're leading to near zero, and a lot of goods and services now are in the sharing economy. Part of it's absorbed into capitalism like Uber, but Uber's not going to be here in 20, 50, 10 years from now. Because all over the world, we're, drivers are saying, wait a minute, what do we need them for? It's our car, it's our labor, it's our insurance, and we're paying them to go on a website that anybody now that's a digital native can set up in our city with cooperatives. It's already started. <laughs> so as the marginal costs are becoming so low, it's leading to the free sharing of goods and services. We have millions of people this morning all over the world on the Internet sharing their own YouTube videos. They're sharing their social blogs and news media. They're taking massive open online college courses and getting college credits. And then there's Wikipedia, fifth largest website in the world. If you eliminate the pornographic websites, I'm sure it's number one in the world this morning. Absolutely. But nobody seems to want to talk about what the data on that for some reason. So I don't know how Jimmy Wales came up with this. Uh, I didn't think it would work. We've democratized education and knowledge. This is extraordinary. Apparently have, no one has anything else to do. Because I put something out there on Wikipedia and within an hour everyone's crawling all over the paragraph. Where's your, where's your footnotes? We've got to have some amplification. I have a different opinion. It checks. We've democratized the knowledge of the world and it costs 50 million to run this nonprofit website because we all give five bucks to them, ten bucks. It's amazing. So while we began to see this disruption in the communication revolution, the Internet, it's now moving to energy, mobility, logistics, and real estate. Let's go back to Germany. What's happened since the first conversation? I think we're around 35% right now, renewables in Germany, 35 to 40. We'll be 65 by 2030. We'll be 100% well before 2040. What's interesting about it is the fixed cost of, renew of energy. Solar and wind have been on an exponential curve and plunging costs for a long time and no one noticed it and that's why we got hit. Really a big hit and disruption. I'm a World War II baby. We didn't have any computers. The first computer was at my university, UNIVAC, University of Pennsylvania. At the time, the chairman of IBM predicted we would need a total of five computers for the world. It was, it was an optimistic forecast, actually. Right? So the millennials dropped on the floor on that one, uh, and the Gen Zs, they said, what? Uh, $25. Well, what's happened is Intel engineers began to, in the 1970s, uh, uh, double the capacity on the chips and half the cost every two years. Smartphone, $25. This has been happening in solar and wind. It used to cost $78 for one fixed watt of solar in the late 70s. It's 43 cents this morning. It's 35 cents in 18 months from now. There are power and utility companies in the last 12 months across Europe and America, quietly, buying long-term 20-year contracts for solar and wind. Listen to this. At 5 cents, 4 cents, 3 cents, and 2 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And here's what's happened. 
big shift this year. This year, the levelized cost of utility scale solar and wind have just dipped below natural gas, and it's plunging. You hear what I'm saying? Way below nuclear, they're gone. Way below coal, gone. Now, below natural gas and plunging. And so what's happening in the boardrooms, I work with electric utilities and CEOs all over the world. Panic has hit the boardrooms. Panic. We saw the beginning of this panic back in 2015. Citigroup, the bank, they saw it coming. They said, oh my God, they didn't say that. They said, we could have $100 trillion here in stranded assets across the fossil fuel industry as solar and wind becomes cheaper. It's now here. $100 trillion. The Economic Intelligence Unit of the Economist says it's at least $40 trillion on worst case scenario, maybe more. This is the biggest bubble in history. And what I'm saying to you, we have studies in this book, which you will get, and these are all in the last 12 months from the banking community, the financial community, the insurance industry, all of the major sectors, the consulting industry, all fresh, all <coughs> places you know, saying it's coming somewhere around 2028, a little before, a little after. This is the biggest bubble, the biggest disruption in all of history. What this means is, as solar and wind continues to plunge the fixed cost, there's another element, the marginal cost. The sun has not sent us a bill in Europe or China and the wind has not invoiced us. The cost of coal, oil, gas, and uranium are extremely expensive to extract and move down the line. So, what we mean by stranded assets is all of the exploration rights they're still buying that will never amortize out. All the fossil fuels under the ground and the ocean floor that will never amortize out because they're too expensive. All the pipelines that will be abandoned. All of the power plants they're still putting in all over Canada and the pipelines and natural gas, which will not be running very much or at all because we don't need them anymore. And if it's a case of storage, let me just address this right away. Batteries have reduced in price by 75% in three years. And we don't need backup natural gas-fired power plants because as we digitize the, the utility grid, it can then deal with base and peak loads from millions of players because the digital technology and the algorithms and analytics allow you to spread the energy and electricity when you need it. We don't need any backup plants. So what's happening here in Canada? Seriously. You got British Columbia sending up pipelines, sending natural gas to Asia. You got the chance plant, the other pipelines here. You've got tar sands. You're digging yourself into a hole. And the countries that are going to be the most hit by this are fossil fuel dependent. You got to make a quick shift. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Eleven trillion dollars have now exited the fossil fuel industry in four years. It started off with just the, you know, the local uh, universities and some foundations, and then the pension funds came in. Karl Marx would be flipping in the grave. Someone ought to wake him up and tell him, guess what, the workers of the world are the capitalists. Because their pension funds are worth $41 trillion. It's the largest pool of capital in the world. They don't know yet that they're a cohort, but they're now recognizing it because of stranded assets. What's happened is the public pension funds are now moving. In Canada, they're just beginning. In the U.S. and in Europe especially, they saw what happened to the coal industry with stranded assets in the U.S. Peabody and the coal companies went bankrupt in the last four years because natural gas was cheaper and then solar and wind became cheaper than natural gas. And guess what? They went bankrupt and all the workers did not get their funds. This is their re deferred salaries. This is not a benefit. This is their wages that were put deferred for investment. So the public pension funds are now getting out. New York's just announced it, the city, and London, and 100 cities around the world in the last two years. They're getting out. They do not want millions of workers. There's 200 million here who will be bankrupt. You with me? So the good news here is $11 trillion have exited fossil fuel industries. Here's the problem. They've got all this liquidity and they're desperately asking for third industrial revolution large-scale deployment of infrastructure so they can invest in green bonds through green banks 
and then that investment will allow them to get low but steady returns over 20 years which will give them a reliable payback to their workers. The problem is there's no scaled projects because while the market is speaking it's government that creates infrastructure. The market didn't create the interstate highway system or national electricity grids by itself. All right. We have 9,000 cities that have signed up for the Global Covenant of Mayors for their climate agreement in Paris. I work with Meryl Sefcovich, who is the co-chair and the vice president of the European Commission. We work together, and if he could tell you, I'll tell you. You go there and talk to these 9,000 mayors, including some in Canada, and they'll show you their 12 shiny electric buses. <laughs> then they'll take you over to their 10 beautiful new lead buildings. Then they'll show you their nice scooters and bike paths that you can place an app on. They're all pilots. So the irony of the situation is the fossil fuel civilization is collapsing in real time. They need deployed projects. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Why didn't we see this in Europe? I'm going to give you the object lesson. We have four major power companies in, in Germany. E EMBW, I work with their CEO, it's Clausen, uh, RWE, Eon, Vattenfall. They didn't understand the notion of how the great disruptions occur. They occur in infrastructure. Schumpeter didn't get this. It's always infrastructure. When you go from horse and carriage to locomotive, that's a big shift. When you go to handwriting to, um, to telegraph, that's a big shift. And what we found, there's a ratio that's very interesting to the investment community. It's not so important how big the market is with the incumbent. It's how fast the challenger is moving into that market. All right. So when electricity took on uh, gas lighting, when electricity got to 3% of the market, it was over because investment saw what was coming. They shifted. What we found in Germany is when we got to 14% of solar and wind in around 2017 in the grid, 20, actually 2016, when we got to 14% solar and wind, it was moving so quick and the, cha and the incumbent nuclear and fossil fuel was slowing, investment got out, we lost 300 billion in 2010 and 2015 alone. 300 billion. You with me? Think Canada. The U.S. reaches 14% solar and wind in its electricity in 2023. The global community reaches 14% solar and wind electricity in 2028. Not just Europe, also China. Uh, I never worked in China, I didn't know anyone there. But just by serendipity, when uh, President Xi and Premier Li came in, Premier Li had said he read the Third Industrial Revolution. I thought it was a joke at first, but it turned out he did. <laughs> And he had instructed in his biography the central government to move on the narratives I'm sharing with you here in Toronto this morning. I've had four official visits working with the leadership. They moved so quick, really. Eleven weeks after the first visit, they announced $80 billion to completely digitize the state grid. And they're doing it now in the 13th five-year plan. And they're putting out 5 million vehicles. And they're getting their own solar and wind, which is the cheapest in the world, and selling it to the neighborhoods and communities so they can create their own energy and send it back to the grid. And they're getting off coal. Not only in China, but across the Belt Road because it's too expensive and natural gas. Natural gas. The coming together of the communication internet and the energy internet makes possible the mobility and logistics internet. Let me, let me say one more thing. For those of you that are in the electric utility industry, it doesn't mean it's over but it means you have to create a new business model very quickly. And uh, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, when Eon, back in 2009, asked me to debate their chairman, Mr. Tyson, he's still there, I said to him, you're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow, but you're going to be hit with this disruption within two or three years, and you've got to be on top of it with a new game plan. The transition's 20 years, the disruption's two. In the new business model, you don't generate any electricity at your utility. Because we're all generating it ourselves. You can't possibly scale every rooftop and own every landscape. This solar and wind is so distributed, you have to collect it in little places wherever you live, wherever the property is. You can scale fossil fuel and nuclear. It's only found in a few places. You can't scale this. So I said, you're not going to generate the electricity, and you're going to sell less electricity and make more money. I said, he said, wait a minute. We're not generating the power, and we're selling less. How do we do that? I said, you're going to set up partnerships with thousands of businesses 
across Germany and Europe, you're going to help manage the energy that flows through their businesses, their value chains, their production, their distribution, logistics. You're going to help them with their analytics, their algorithms and apps so they can dramatically increase their aggregate efficiency at every conversion across their businesses, reduce their uh, footprint, carbon footprint, and then they will share these performance gains back with the electricity company and performance contracts. He waited too long. He put his fossil fuel and nuclear on the market two and a half years ago. No bidders. Every power company in Europe, and now we're starting in the United States, are moving to the business model our office provided for them. Some started early enough, like Engie. I'll be with them in a few weeks. Some did not start. Soon enough, they're going to be gone. These two internets, communication and energy, give us the third internet, mobility and logistics. We built the entire world economy on making and selling cars and all the attendant industries that went with that. Here's the problem. Do we have any millennials here? <laughs> you are the problem in the back row. <laughs> apparently, you haven't understood this. Because apparently you don't want to own automobiles anymore. That's grandma and grandpa, two automobiles, sitting in the driveway, waxing them once a month, an hour a day at the office. You prefer... prefer access to mobility and car sharing networks in real time rather than ownership in vehicles that are sitting there in markets. Am I correct? This is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be. Because for every car you're sharing, we're eliminating 10 to 15 vehicles. And the new studies from inside the industry, I work with the auto industry, they're showing that when the industry, that we're going to eliminate 80% of the 1.3 billion cars, buses, and trucks in the next 25 to 30 years. Gone. The last of the 250 million vehicles will be car shared. They'll be autonomous. They'll be electric and fuel cell. The material will be composite, fabricated, recycled material. We don't need the metals anymore. They're already doing it. And this is a huge leap forward in reduction of carbon footprint and the amount of the earth we use. <laughs> How serious is this? Remember I said the inflection point for electricity was 14% and then it's over and then you have massive stranded assets? Here's the inflection point and these are the studies in the book from inside the industries in the last 12 months. We're only producing 2% EVs a year, although I just understand Mustang's coming out, they're coming out with a Mustang EV. It's going to really sell. It's cool. Bright red. Everybody's going to want it. <laughs> uh, Mustang has a third, fourth, and fifth life here. All right, so only 2% of annual sales right now are electric vehicles, but the projected studies are that by 2023, electric vehicles will be uh, even on price, no subsidy. By 2026, they'll be cheaper than internal combustion vehicles. By 2028, 20% of vehicles in the world, annual sales will be EVs. How serious are the auto companies taking this? Well, let me just use one example, Volkswagen the number one producer of cars, they vie with Toyota. They're number one right now. Toyota just announced that they're putting out the last internal combustion platform ever at Volkswagen in 2026. It's the last one. They just announced 80 billion euros to move to EVs. Does that sound serious? One company, 80 billion euros. They say they will be producing 22 million EVs by 2028, one-fourth of global production to stay in the business. They have just joined with Bechtel, and they're putting in 35,000 charging stations across Europe in the next three years to four years. The other companies are moving at the same speed. This is a revolution, but again, let me explain why this is so important in mobility. We consume 93 million barrels of oil a day in the world. Two-thirds of it goes to transport. It's over. Here's the problem, Ben. Go back to the problem. Trillions of dollars coming out of the fossil fuel complex, stranded assets. But the business community can create the market conditions, but they can't create the infrastructure. That means every province and territory in Canada has to create the infrastructure. The national government here, the federal government, has to set the codes, the regulations, the standards, the alignment, the carrots and the sticks, and the national power grid. But every region will be responsible for deployment. Just like in my country, while all the presidential candidates in the Democratic Party are talking about a new deal like this was 1932 with a centralized infrastructure, this is not. This is 2019. 
Ninety three percent of our infrastructure, someone ought to explain to our Democratic candidates, who I love, is owned by the states, <laughs> just like your regions. And they, they're the ones that do it. So while President Trump is sitting there in doing nothing on this, 29 states now have renewable energy portfolios. And the U.S. Conference of Mayors just announced a climate emergency. 91% of the GDP is in those cities, and they're calling for Green New Deals, and they're starting to set them up across the country.